Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic topology. Today I would like to tell you about Horwich's theorem. I'm probably pronouncing the name horribly wrong, but uh, that's just what it is. I'm, I'm just ignorant. Anyway, um, so Horwich's theorem is this kind of the only really relation between homotopy and homology. It's kind of a natural question. We know homotopy, we know homology. They kind of time seem to be the same. Uh, but they also, on the other hand, seem to be very different. So what is actually the relation between them? And it's really captured in the theorem. And it's kind of kind of the best theorem you can hope for, uh, as I'm going to explain, if you're looking for a relation between homotopy and homology. So let's start with our old favorite example. Uh, so this is S2. Um, maybe I should have chosen a different color to make it more visible. So this is, well, maybe red. This is S2. And uh, in general, there would be something like Sn, which looks like a higher dimensional soccer ball, of course. And um, yeah, so what you would like to compare, at least now, is you will make a list of certain uh, homologies and homotopies, uh, and you just compare them. And of course, you start with the sphere. So how does it look like? Um, well, it looks like this. So the lower ones are trivial. That's relatively easy to see. Um, the Sn, so Sn of pi n, uh, sorry, pi n of Sn is z. Um, that's also not so hard to see. And the higher ones are extremely mysterious. So somehow there's no way you can compute them. Um, so they're just really, really complicated. And you would like to compare this with homology. And it turns out I should kind of compare this with the twiddle homology. Uh, so I, the twiddle homology was the uh, reduced one, which is actually the same. So hn equals uh, the usual hn for all n except zero. So there's a difference for the connected part, for the connected component part. But we can kind of ignore that um, for all um, n bigger than zero. So kind of ignore the twiddle. Uh, basically. So um, what you would do is you would compute that here is actually the same is true. So all of the lower ones are trivial. And that's, of course, for the experts where you need to twiddle. Anyway, so the, the lower ones are trivial. That's really easy to see because homology is just very easy to compute. Um, the important one, Hn of Sn is Z, again, super easy to see. And the higher ones is trivial, are uh, trivial, again, super easy to see because homology is just so computable. And as I said, I could put a twiddle here if I want to. I wouldn't change anything because they are, they are not zero anyway. So the n is not zero. Here. So it seems to be the kind of a hopeless question to, to compare them. OK, they kind of agree on this bottom part, and they kind of agree in the middle. But at least here, the, the relation is completely mysterious. Um, so one of them is absolutely trivial, and the other one is just crazy. So there's probably no real relation between them. Um, and the question. I would like to address today is what is actually, can, can we write down any relation between um, the pies and the edges? Can we do that? Is there any relation? Mm, maybe, maybe not. It seems from this example, there could be something because they agree up to a certain point, uh, but certainly we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't expect too much because at one point, one of them, as I said, just gets really crazy and the other one is trivial. Okay, so maybe you just can, guess from this point uh, that, well, OK, maybe ju it's just a statement like the pies are always more complicated than the ages. Up to a certain point, they agree. And then the pies are more complicated than the ages. And then you do the next example, the torus, the ST2, my torus. Of course, this is the next example you would do. Kind of the point is too boring. So first example would be the sphere. Next example would be the torus. You play the same game. Um, and for the torus, it's a bit trickier in some sense. So you would kind of see that they agree up to a certain point. And the point where they agree is actually just the zero. So pi zero of Tn is trivial. Of course it is. Um, H zero of Tn is trivial if you put a tilt up. Uh, so if you use H tilt, then it's trivial. And then they agree on a certain slice. So pi one and H one are actually the same. They are z to the n. Uh, so I'm talking about Tn here, if you remember. Uh, for T2, you had two generators. One of them goes around like this, and the other one, other one goes around like this. And they are kind of both generators for homology and um, homotopy. So they agree on pi 1. And then something funny comes into the game. Because the universal cover here of this beast is Rn, 
and Rn is contractible, you can actually see that the higher homotopy groups are all trivial. They're all trivial. Higher homotopy groups are all trivial, while the higher homotopy groups, this is an N here, um, are given by the binomial theorem. So they're definitely not trivial. You can, can, can compute them. So it's slightly different than for, for the sphere where you were just not able to compute them. They're just mysterious. But they're still way, way bigger than the trivial one. So kind of everything is reversed here. Um, the only pattern that remains is here. They agree. So this checks, this checks. Very similar here. This checks, this checks. And here you don't know. And again, here you can't really tell. Maybe that is what we should expect somehow. So up to a certain point, um, we can, might be able to say something. And beyond that, we can't really tell. And really, this shows that both can get fancy. So there is also no statement such, something like uh, the pi's are more complicated than the h's because both can get fancy and both can get trivial. Kind of everything can happen that you can think about. So the question is still the same. So let's have a look at the correct notion here. It seems like it should happen in the slice where they agree, somehow in the dimension slice in some sense, in the pi n slice. And the correct notion here is actually the notion of connectedness in a higher way. So you say something is n connected. If you have some stupid conditions, like it's not empty and pass connected, you can ignore them. The really important condition here is that um, the pi's are trivial. So it's called n connected if the lower pi's are trivial. In particular, the spheres n minus 1 connected, because as I said, pi n of uh, Sn is the first interesting one is z. Okay, so this kind of is off by one error. So Sn is Sn minus 1 connected. Whatever. Um, if you wonder why where this notion comes from, you've all seen that before. So <laughs> there's a minus one connected. If you want to take consider minus one connected spaces, sure you can do that. That every space is minus one connected unless it's empty. Okay, fine. If you, <laughs> whatever. If you want to consider, some people do that. What, what is me really more important is kind of the zero connected and the one connected. So if you want to consider zero connected, then well, it's zero connected if and only if it's kind of non-trivial and pass connected, and it's one connected if and only if, and that's kind of where. It, where the generalization comes from, it's simply connected, meaning that the uh, homotopy groups, the fundamental group is zero. Note that this notion says nothing about homologies, only about lower order fundamental groups. So it's only about this part here, basically. It's not saying anything else, just the end connector is only saying something about this lower homotopy groups, the fundamental group and all the other lower homotopy groups up to a certain point. So the statement itself is then actually pretty surprising. Because as I said, in this n connected, there is no homology involved. And you start kind of get that for free. So the statement is for each n bigger than 0, there exists a group homomorphism, um, which is called the Hurwitz homomorphism, from the pi to the h. Problem is, it could, could be anything in general. But anyway, there is a group homomorphism. And this is an isomorphism under the condition that x is n minus 1 connected, and n is not 1. So um, if you're not talking about the fundamental group, the fundamental group is a little bit special. This is actually an isomorphism, um, which is kind of what you would expect here. So it follows that all the lower uh, ones are actually also 0. Um, so you kind of get this picture here. Uh, so you kind of get this picture. And beyond that, you can't say anything anymore. Right? So that's kind of the point. If you kind of know the, the homotopy group up to a certain point, and you can say that it's trivial. So your space is n minus 1 connected. You kind of get the next step for free in the sense that uh, the pi is, is equal to the, to the h. Beyond that, no control anymore, basically. Basically, no control anymore. Um, kind of a fun fact. And it's kind of nice. So a nice corollary of, of this statement is the homological version of Whitehead theorem, which is way weaker in some sense than Whitehead theorem. Uh, but it's for homology, and homology is kind of a little bit nicer in some sense than uh, homotopy. And it says it, it reads exactly the same. So homotopy equivalent is uh, equivalent to this isomorphism on the homology groups for nice spaces. So what are nice spaces? Certainly cell complexes, so that's the same as for Whitehead theorem. But you own, also need this condition of being simply connected. So somehow you want control over pi 1 
and then you kind of get, can get can puzzle uh, the rest together, but you really need this control over phi one. Anyway, it's still a pretty cool uh, application of this Hubbard theorem. It's a homolog homological version of Whitehead theorem, if you want to uh, call it that. So I said again, the following are equivalent. So it's a homotopy invariance. This is easy. This is kind of the easy part. So if it is a homotopy invariance, of course, the, uh, there will be an isomorphism between the homology groups. That's kind of how homology groups work. But the converse is absolutely not clear. Uh, but it's true, and it follows from this comparison theorem between homology and homotopy, which is kind of nice. I have one more slide, and you wonder now what I have to say. Well, let's be careful here. So let's have a look again. The torus, my example here, that doesn't quite fit in the theorem. So let's have a look. The torus, I, I claim that there's kind of the same kind of structural properties of or comparison properties of homology and homotopy as the as a sphere, but it actually doesn't fit because it's zero connected. And I claim this only uh, turns up if n is bigger than one. So it kind of ignores the case where it's zero connected. So this doesn't quite fit. So wait, 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 wait. What are you talking about? Um, actually, there's a small number of coincidence in this Horwich theorem, which is kind of the more well-known one in some sense. Um, so here it is. And that's where the torus comes into the game. So in general, this H star map, this forward homomorphism, this one here is just nothing. You can't expect anything here. Let's have a look at these examples here. So this is just super crazy. It's just trivial and huge. And here it's even worse. It's trivial and God knows what it is. It's mysterious. So um, in general, I wouldn't expect anything interesting to happen. So you can't say it's injective or subjective. You basically can't say anything about it. Um, but turns out for n equals 1, which is exactly the case that is ignored by uh, the statement on this slide. For n equals 1, this is always subjective. So for n equals 1, so pi 1 always subjects onto uh, h1. OK, so this is kind of pretty This is kind of pretty good. So in this one small number coincidence case, this is always actually subjective. And you can compute the kernel, because the kernel is always given by, so this is a non-abelian group, non-abelian. And this is abelian, so this is commutative. And you just kill, as you just make it commutative, you, you kill the so-called commutator. And you get this isomorphism, which is kind of the well-known, the more well-known one, uh, the Horvich isomorphism between pi 1 and h1. It's not quite between pi 1, it's between the abelianization of pi 1. So you make pi 1 abelian, and then it's isomorphic to h1. And this is how the torus fits into the game, because well, the torus just ha it happens that the pi one is already a billion. If the pi one is already a billion, then a billionization doesn't do anything, of course. So pi one is just isomorphic to h one, and this is how it kind of fits in. So it's part of the same story, but not quite of the most of this general theorem for the higher ones, because pi one always plays a special role. So we kind of need to treat that separately. Anyway, so let me summarize. So the Schroeder theorem is this comparison theorem between. A homotopy and homology. In general, we can't expect anything. The Hobbes homomorphism is just nothing. But for some kind of small cases, it's actually pretty nice. For example, for the fundamental group, it's always subjective, and the kernel is always given by abelianization. So a pi one modular abelianization is always isomorphic to H one, which I think is a pretty cool statement because in the end, you, H one is easier to compute. So you kind of want to kind of get a guess what pi one is. That's you, how you usually we use it. Not always, you can, of course, also compute h1 if you already know pi1. But uh, more important somehow is uh, usually to compute the pi's because the ages are kind of easy anyway. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I also hope to see you next time.